Well, I'm here with Paul Levy. Paul, welcome to the podcast. Like I was saying before we started recording, it's been a long time coming. I've wanted to talk to you for years, and I'm happy it finally is happening on the occasion of this new book, um, Undreaming with Tico, which I think is your third book centered around with Tico, yeah? Yeah, no, it's 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 the third of a trilogy, and I'm just really happy to be here with you. So thank you. Yeah. Well, um, I'm imagining that there are people in my audience who may not know of your work, and I was hoping to uh, lay some groundwork before we really get into things. So sure. maybe if you could just offer a, a little uh, bit of personal background, like what's your um, sure. kind of professional background? What, yeah. Yeah. A little yeah. bit about who you are. So my my background is is unique in that, you know, so I um had this life transforming spiritual awakening that got that got catalyzed by profound trauma and suffering. And you know, without going into the story, I was in my early 20s and I went from being a, you know, a happy, healthy, very accomplished kid and good student and all that to then this unbelievable kind of emotional trauma happened in my family, where just the one, I guess, pertinent piece of information in my father, what he got cast in the role of perpetrating his unhealed abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, and I was the recipient. And it just created over the top suffering. And I went inwards, um, because I quickly figured out I couldn't figure my way out of it with my intellect. And so I just assumed the position of the witness and began delving into my own process, into my own mind. And I was in my early 20s. And, and then after a couple of years of doing that very intensely, um, then I got hit by a bolt of lightning in meditation one day, just in my brain, it just ignited. And I went into uh, just this extreme state where I basically began to realize we're having a collective dream. And I was so ecstatic at what I was realizing that it freaked people out. And immediately I got hospitalized and diagnosed and, oh, you're mentally ill and you're going to need to be on medication the rest of your life. You know, this was in 1981. And the year before in the DSM, the the, the new discovery of the so-called chemical imbalance had just come out. So every psychiatrist who was diagnosing me with this chemical imbalance. And just a footnote is that a number of years later, the same psychiatrists who were the authors of the DSM-3 in 1980 came out and said, oh, by the way, there's no such thing as a chemical imbalance. We made that up, you know, inspired by the pharmaceutical companies to make more money. I actually have the quotes of the actual psychiatrist in another book of mine. And, um, but I didn't for a second buy into the diagnosis I was just having this absolute over-the-top spiritual awakening, but psychiatry, they almost destroyed me because they were medicating me and pathologizing me and not recognizing, you know, the healthy spiritually awakening part of me. And they were protecting my father, the abuser. It was unbelievable, the incredible insanity and um, abuse that psychiatry perpetrated and I was so I was lucky to um, I got out very quickly of that system, and I knew something had happened. And all everybody in my world just thought, "Oh, I'm in denial of my mental illness." And so it took me a long time, you know, over a decade of going to therapy and making art and dreaming and doing plant medicine and studying shamanism and alchemy and you know just everything and anything under the sun that I felt was helping me to integrate what I was experiencing. And so then fast forward to maybe 94, that's when I started teaching. Cause then I realized, well, I'm not like, you know, I'm not like an enlightened person, but I've gone through this initiatory ordeal that has given me some sort of understanding that would be helpful for people. That's medicine. So that's when I started my groups and started giving lectures and workshops and began teaching and I haven't had to have a job since. I mean, that's been my full-time profession. And then out of that came these books, you know, on Watiko. 
And, um, and that was profound for me because the main thing that I'm realizing is that the medicine for this mind virus that ails our species that were playing out all over the world and the evil, that's the consequence of it, is um, that the solution is for us to connect with our creative spirit. And so the writing for me was the medium through which I was doing that and through which I was deepening my own healing. And um, so, yeah, I'm not, you know, your typical academic or scholar or PhD or anything like that. Um, no, I have no degree in any of this. And yet so many of my clients are like Jungian analysts or psychiatrists or therapists or, you know, stuff like that. My whole trip is just completely experiential. And um, it almost killed me and it destroyed my entire family. It was like the mind virus. Watiko got into the petri dish of my family and destroyed my entire family and I was a I was like witnessing this and trying to illuminate but then I began to realize oh this same mind virus that came through my father and came into my family was informing the system of psychiatry and even more than that was giving shape to you know the evil and the madness that's playing out in the greater body politic as if they were iterations of a fractal of the same fractal. So, um, you know, I've been fortunate in that I've been able to turn my direct unmediated encounter with archetypal evil into some sort of medicine. And, you know, that actually is healing me and helping other people. If I wasn't able to do that, I would have been destroyed. I mean, it was just overwhelming. I mean, it was like getting a transfusion or getting bit by a vampire is getting a transfusion of this this what he called mind virus pathogen into my very system and it wanted to make me its host mm -hmm. and gradually gradually over the years i've been able to alchemically transmute it into my work really mm -hmm. yeah well i mean there's a lot there uh first thing that uh i'm wondering about like well just to notice that uh there's the kind of initial trauma with your father and then there's like further trauma by the system, by the psychiatric system, right. gas, gaslighting by these uh, psychiatrists and then the family. Um, so that, that's a lot to deal with. I mean, you must have felt quite alone. And, and I'm wondering, like, getting into the depth psychology, the alchemy, the shamanism. Now, was it specific practices that helped you to integrate that experience? Or was it, uh, were they giving you a different context to understand what was happening with you? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So on the one hand, I just, what you said at first, I just want to highlight, I didn't have anyone in the family system who could play the role of the enlightened witness who saw what I was pointing at. So I was pointing at the abuse and the evil that was coming through my father and the whole family system was protecting the abuser and then i was trying to point that out and everybody thought i was the crazy one and i became the identified patient you know so mm -hmm. uh, that's the just to comment on the first thing you said and then you know so i was fortunate in that i knew when i got out of that hospital that something profound was happening to me but the only reflection i was getting from western medicine was that oh you're just crazy you're mentally ill and um so I just was certain I had to find people who spoke the language who I didn't have to translate to. And I was fortunate in that I found um, some of the greatest of the enlightened teachers in the world from, from Tibet, Burma, different traditions, you know, Theravadan and or Tibetan Buddhism, who I became incredibly close with. And they're like family. I've known them you know, 40, over four, close to 40 years and so on the one hand, they gave me particular practices to do particular, you know, I was initiated into particular lineages and traditions, and I was fortunate enough to do the practices, not just to read the books or receive the empowerments, but to do the practices. And then I was very self-motivated because I was in so much pain about, you know, from what had happened, there was the double trauma of the abuse from my father, then psychiatry, and I lost all my friends. And I mean, it was, it was wild. And so, you know, I was deeply studying the, the work, you know, uh, there's the Young Foundation in New York, 
that I found out about and I was going there and I was, you know, deeply immersing myself in Jung's work so much so that they actually hired me to manage the bookstore after a certain point because everybody knew me because I was always there. And, um, you know, but then I was just doing, you know, plant medicine or just anything, you know, that would help. I was really open because when you're that desperate, the, the suffering was so overwhelming that it opens you up and it doesn't make a difference what tradition or what teacher, or if anything, you know, spoke to my soul, I would follow that thread. And then over the course and the whole while I was making art and connecting with my dreams and beginning to have these lucid dreams and the, the traditions I was getting in touch with were helping me understand, oh, I had gotten enlisted into a deeper mythic archetypal process that really helped instead of just assuming the position of the personalistic lens and seeing everything as, oh, I'm just screwed up and this is what's happening and it's reflecting how screwed up I am. No, I began to understand. No, there was like a deeper divine cosmic incarnation process that all of us are participating in. But I was becoming more conscious of, oh, wow, it's like I'm playing a role in this, in the dream, in a deeper dreaming process. And a major part of it was confronting this darker part, this shadow, not just my own personal shadow, but archetypal shadow, archetypal evil. And I couldn't get away from that. And um, and then over the course of the years, I began to realize, well, I'm synthesizing all of these different, these wisdom, you know, um, these traditions in my own unique way. And that's when I began to write my books and to teach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two quotes from Jung come to mind. The first one, um, you know, he who looks outside dreams, he looks within awakes. Right. Uh, awakens, that yeah, seems like... Totally that was a pivotal move for you uh, to stop looking outside for answers, turn inward. And then um, even, uh, yeah, look to other traditions for like that personal myth that Jung thought was so important for us to discover, you know, what is the myth that, uh, that you're living? He thought that was such an essential question. Yeah. So you can find a narrative that helps you understand the process that you're undergoing, the role that you're playing, all of that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can, can I comment on that because that's really profound. Because the yeah. idea of this mind virus, the Watiko mind virus, one of the major strategies of it is to distract us so that we put our attention outside. And like, oh, the problems outside, oh, the solutions outside. And as long as we do that, then the real source of the problem, you know, is within ourselves and we're not looking there. Because, you know, people hear about this mind virus and, you know, people who've drank ayahuasca or really doing inner work right away, they get, oh, yeah, that makes sense to me. But like consensus reality, people hear about a mind virus and it just sounds kind of woo woo and crazy and all that. But in essence, what it means is that the source, because Watiko is a collective psychosis and what it, what the mind virus, the idea of a mind virus means is that the source and the solution of our collective madness is to be found within the psyche. And that's a no brainer. Where else could the source of our collective madness be found? Mm. You know? uh, well, I mean, nice play on words. I don't know if it was intentional, but it's a no brainer. I mean, you're not going to find the solution up <laughs> right, in, that the, inte in the right. intellect, but yeah, deeper in the psyche. Right. Um, Okay, well, you've been mentioning with Tico as a as a mind virus, as a collective psychosis. Could you go into a little more detail about with Tico? But first, um, was there a time where you maybe had an experience or an encounter where you're able to identify like, ah, this is some kind of entity or archetypal force unto itself? And you know, how did it how did you come to identify it as with Tico and all of that? Yeah, well, so so what happened? you know, just to essentialize it. So there were these escalating episodes of abuse from my father. He was just acting out his unhealed abuse instead of him doing his inner work. He was just almost like he couldn't not act it out. He compulsively acted it out, you know, by just becoming possessed by some sort of seeming entity where he would just become possessed by this demonic murderous rage. And I was the recipient. And then he'd be having heart attacks and 
as that's happening, he's telling me I'm killing him while I'm being afraid I'm going to be murdered. It was, and it kept on escalating. And it was all when I was individuating and separating and stepping into my own self. And so after, you know, the next morning of the worst of those episodes, I had a fever for a year and there was nothing physically wrong with me. I went to hospitals and doctors. And then at the end of, end of that year, that seeming entity that had taken over my father all of a sudden was now inside of me. And it was like my outer, you know, abuse with my father that I just described was now actually getting enacted inside of my own mind. In, in, and that's the way abuse works. Like somebody might play the role of the abuser, then they exit stage left. And if the abuse takes hold, it gets it gets internalized in our minds such that we then enact the abuse. And that's crazy making, you know, to see like a part of us turn against ourselves and and destroy ourselves. So that was really the initial experience of like, what is this? Because I saw it was me doing it to myself and I didn't know how to stop, but it was also as if there was some sort of other seeming entity. And I say seeming because I don't want to invest it with yeah. an actual reality that it doesn't warrant. And so all of a sudden, once that happened, I realized I had a big problem because I went from being a very accomplished young kid to not being able to live my life. And that's when I began. And then I began dreaming night after night after night, these incredible dreams that were showing me that, yeah, I what I was dealing with, I was having a direct encounter with evil. And it was either going to destroy me or drive me crazy or make me its host. Or if I was able to navigate it, there was a potential of maybe transforming it and myself into something that was helpful you know mm -hmm. so and then and then i just began more and more tracking holy cow this seemingly this this malevolent energy was actually informing events in the world collectively in the greater body politic of our planet it was informing my own unconscious reactions it was mm -hmm. operating through my own blind spots through my own mind it was operating via relationships where all of a sudden people who are, you know, partners or lovers or friends or, and they, they're really connected all of a sudden there'd be a misunderstanding or they wouldn't be able to hear each other, or there's a sense of feeling hurt or projected on, and then they would separate. And I began to realize, wow, it's as if backstage under the scene, behind the scenes is this seeming energy or entity that's inspiring this incredible separation. Mm. And so I began to uh, to have the realization oh my god i'm tracking something and even more than that that the whole abuse was actually you know this like it was like something was being shown to me it was like this revelation you could say this living mm -hmm. revelation that and i'm still unpacking what was being what was being shown to me through my encounter with evil and that's one of the things i point out in my work is that the Watiko um, psychic epidemic that's playing out all over the world, that it actually is a revelation, that it's teaching us something that is incredibly important for us to know. But if we don't recognize it, it's going to kill us. Hmm. Well, I mean, so much of your story resonates with uh, experiences that I've had. And maybe just to check with you, like, uh, let me share a bit of my experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I went through some pretty heavy duty traumas when I was young. Um, and when I was 16, there was a few things that happened all in that year that were uh, really traumatizing. And at the time I was uh, exploring lucid dreaming, out of body experiences, that kind of thing. And I had learned that if I, if I took some uh, cough syrup with codeine in it, and I did deep breathing exercises that I could leave my body. So I was uh, practicing this one day, lying on my bed, and I, I left my body. And all of a sudden, I could hear and sense something rushing at me. I could hear uh, footsteps on the carpet, and I felt a force uh, rushing toward me. And it scared me so badly, I slammed back into my body and, you know, heart racing, incredibly scared. 
Now, fast forward uh, probably 20 years, and I'm doing um, quite a bit of work with ayahuasca in, in a church where the focus is on um, helping suffering spirits return to the light, just as a summation. So there is a kind of incorporation involved with it, mediumship, that kind of thing. Um, and I was visiting a friend who's a craniosacral therapist, and he had offered to give me a, a treatment so that I could experience it. And I'm lying on his table, and he's doing um, the treatment on me, and it's very subtle movements, very rhythmic kind of rocking motions through my whole uh, body. And all of a sudden, in my mind's eye, there was a demonic face, just like full frame, like that... Uh, like that split second shot in the exorcist where you get to see captain howdy the demon and it completely shocked me but in that split second when i saw that face i was reminded of that experience when i was 16 right. and the understanding of it came to me all all at once that um because of my trauma i had invited this entity or opened myself to this entity to come in and it had been acting behind the scenes of my life um Right. In a way, protecting me by keeping people at a distance through my reactivity, my kind of sharp tongue and sense of humor, things like that. So it was in a way protecting me from anybody getting too close to avoid getting hurt to that degree again. Uh, but it had started to interrupt my life and what I really wanted, which was, you know, I've gotten married and I was having trouble with my my wife and I wanted more closeness and I wanted to be kind of free of these uh, unconscious reactions that were causing a lot of disruption in my life. And so then I went through this whole process during the next um, ceremonies of uh, negotiating with this entity and actually thanking it for serving me, but uh, that it was no longer working in my life. And, um, and then I had this whole kind of release ceremony that felt like a rebirth and after that, I felt like there was a single person inside of me for the first time in a very long time. And I had no way to understand this. And I, I was uh, really careful not to just um, assume that it was an external entity. I thought, well, it's possible that there was some, some part of my psyche that uh, got personified and um, some part of my own shadow. I'm ambivalent about it. Uh, I, I don't want to make any claims one way or the other, but the way I found was helpful to work with it was to act as if it was an autonomous entity that I could negotiate with. Right. That's exactly right, the way you describe it, because you see these seeming entities, they're, you know, one way to think about it, when we get traumatized, like, so for me, I got like so traumatized that it was like there was like, my boundaries got there was like the rupture and and through that rupture that's where you know this seemingly dark force entered and um so the thing is we get traumatized which by definition it's overwhelming we can't integrate it in the normal way we can't symbolically express it so then we split we disassociate and if we don't integrate that, that over the over time becomes um, it, it's as if as if once again it develops a seemingly autonomous life and independent will of its own that's adversarial to us. And so in psychology speak, that's an autonomous complex. Indigenous people call that a demon. That's mm -hmm. Watiko. And the thing is, ultimately speaking, it doesn't have any independent existence at all, separate from your own consciousness, but it's like a profound it, it's the thing that's needed is to relate to it as if it's an actual objective independent entity and then you know when you do that and you dialogue with it or have relationship with it you're distinguishing yourself from it because it only has power over you when you're blind to it what he goes a form of blindness where you're unconsciously identified with it, you can't see it. So then you're unwittingly acting it out. You, you're becoming an instrument through which it acts itself out on our world. So to treat it as if it actually has an independent existence, that's exactly right. And by doing that, you're objectifying it. And by objectifying it, you're actually seeing it, you know, because 
just remember these seeming entities operate through our blind spots, through our unconscious. And then we unwittingly become the vehicle, you know, mm -hmm. through which, you know, it acts itself out or we act it out unwittingly. So what you're describing, I mean, that's, I, I, that's so completely precisely accurate. Yeah. Yeah. So you would say that uh, this is what you're talking about when you're talking about Watiko, this kind yeah, of experience. Yeah yeah. 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 There are a lot of different ways. I mean, I contemplate it because the whole thing about Watiko, it doesn't even exist. There's no such thing at all, has no independent intrinsic existence from its own side, and yet it can kill us. That's hmm. the paradox. So because it operates through our blind spots, through the part of us that has that's not aware. And so that's why I'm continually circumambulating and trying to point at it from all these different ways, because when we see it, we take away its power over us and we become empowered. And so the way we were just describing it is as if it's an entity and relate to it like that and all that, you know, and it's it's really this autonomous complex or this demon, but ultimately it just belongs to our wholeness. That's one of the, the myriad ways of, of describing Watiko. Yeah, well, that's how um, uh, shamanism was helpful to me in the personification of this entity. Um, and like you said, once you personify it, or once um, you accept its persona that it's presenting, automatically you're disidentified from it. So there's enough separation there that you can start to work with it or deal with it, right? Yeah. Um, so that's what the shamanic understanding- and Can I just say one thing about what yeah. you're describing? This is exactly, when you study the work of Jung, it, this is exactly what, what he's recommending, is to yeah. personify your demons, you know, and then do active imagination with it. That's the way of stripping them of their power. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess what I was going to say was that, uh, oh, where was I going to go? Yeah, there's a, there's that whole move of the personification, the disidentification. Um, but that's what the shamanism gave to me was uh, that move. So if we're talking about it as an autonomous complex, I mean, that's so abstract, you know, all that psychological jargon. And I think, think you know, that's what I've been trying to advocate for is for psychology to be informed from other traditions, like spiritual traditions, shamanic traditions. Um, so it's less abstracted and more, like you said, objectified or or real in a way, personified. Um, that's something that we lose if we're just caught up in yeah. psychological jargon. Yeah, well, the thing is, absolutely. And, you know, um, from my point of view, the idea of an autonomous complex isn't abstract. I mean, that helped me when I found that name. Because, you know, just like in a fairy tale, when you find the name of the demon, you take away its power, you know, so there's this, it's a magical act of finding the name. And it's interesting, because so many of my clients are shamans who are therapists, and they're trying to like synthesize those two professions and and in the new book there i think the the like biggest chapter in the whole book is exactly about this about about shamanism and interestingly i finished that chapter a week or two before the lockdown and i was basically i didn't realize how prescient i was being i was saying oh our species is going through a shamanic death rebirth experience where we're being forced to descend into the darkness of the unconscious and, um, you know, what I was pointing out that the major archetype that's activated in the collective unconscious is, is the shamanic archetype. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I can say a lot more about that. And I should just make clear, you know, I'm, I'm no shaman. You know, I joke only, you know, with my friends and I'm only a shaman in, in my wildest dreams. But the shamanic archetype, which is the deeper pattern, had gotten activated in me because I was so wounded, because I was so traumatized, because of the trauma. I split, and um, and then that consolates the shamanic journey. That at a certain point, you know, another part of you goes in search of, you know, this this dismembered, the lost parts, goes in the lost part, so as to retrieve right. her soul. And um, so that that's why I can speak with real authority because I've been doing that, you know, um, twenty four seven for forty plus years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. A, a good uh, way to distinguish it. Um, it you know, a, a working shaman who's part of a community and doing that work versus the shamanic archetype, which anyone 
can go through. And it's just a way to kind of name a, a pattern uh, or a phenomenon in your life, like psychological splitting. Well, that's just like the shamanic dismemberment, um, the going within to recover lost parts, to integrate oneself. Well, right. that's the descent into the other world, the underworld, um, classic archetypal shamanic journey. Um, and then the return with some uh, kind of insight or medicine exactly. that you can then offer to the community. Exactly, right? exactly. And the thing is, you know, there are, there are two dangers of the whole shamanic trip. On the one hand, there are people who have a little bit of experience. Oh, they drank ayahuasca once and they have a little insight. And the next thing you know, they're putting out a shingle that they're a shaman, you know, and they have no idea of the powers and principalities they're dealing with. And they could really do damage to themselves and hurt other people. But the other danger is really interesting is for us to stay unconscious of our intrinsic shamanic abilities, you know, mm -hmm. and we all have these incredible like sensitivities or creativity or, you know, um, just these capabilities, you know, of empathy and all that. And if we then compartmentalize those and don't consciously connect with that, that creates poison in, in, mm. in our psyches. Yeah. Or even just disempowerment, like, and I'll add to your list, I think um, access to imagination is a big part of right. uh, being a shamanic uh, person or, or or working with that capacity. Uh, if we don't connect to that and liven that in ourselves, we're always going to be looking to somebody on the outside to do the healing for us, right? And so I wrote a book in 2019 based on my experiences called Yoga and Plant Medicine. And one of the little chapters in there was an advocating to be your own shaman, to um, learn practices, learn techniques, to do your inner work and do your own kind of soul retrieval. Um, well, that, I, yeah. I, that, what you were just saying is so right on. I talk about that in my book too, the one that just came out in the chapter on shamanism. I say, yeah, if when you get called, because nobody in their right mind would ever voluntarily choose to be a shaman, yeah. <laughs> you'd have to be out of your mind because the suffering is so overwhelming. Yeah. But if you're called, you know, um, and if you can find a shaman to help you to deal with your suffering, great, then you're in luck. But the majority of people who are called to be shamans know they have to become their own shaman. They have to figure out their own way, you know, and that's why, you know, the shaman is the storyteller, is is the the one who's the dreamer, is the creative artist. It's It's propelling you to in a creative way to metabolize your wound, you know, into light, into medicine, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you're an artist as well, right? There's some yeah. of your drawings in your, in your books and um, beautiful stuff. So how, uh, how is art helping you to metabolize all these wild experiences? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No art. I mean, I can't say enough about the importance, the profundity of, connecting with our creative process like for me just i think about my books um you know it's not like oh i have all this information and i'm just writing it down to offer no the act of creatively trying to find the words that process itself is deepening my realization of what it is i'm trying to express and um you know so the idea of like i think of me like what one way of describing my abuse is that my father i was individuating i was in college and i was realizing i was stepping out of being you know a math economics i was studying you know like really mainstream stuff to, to realizing no i'm an artist and i have to follow my calling and my father somehow interpreted that like oh i have to absolutely obliterate that calling so that my son will become the doctor and lawyer that I envisioned him to be. And so what he didn't realize is that by doing that, by trying to destroy my creative impulse, it actually made it stronger. Because if it's the true creative impulse, it can't be kept down for long. And the thing about the creative impulse, it's hidden within. There's a figure, you can, we can call it like the, the inner guide or like daimon is another word for it. And the daimon is the guiding spirit, the inner guide. It's the source of like our genius, of our calling, of our vocation. 
helping us to hear our inner voice. And, um, you know, if we connect with that daimon, it, it will like inspire us on the path to actualize who we are. But if we don't relate to that daimon and, oh, I'm not good enough, I'm not, you know, talented enough or whatever, it then constellates in a negative way and becomes a demon. Mm -hmm. And, but the point is encoded in that daimon is the creative spirit, you know, and that's the spirit it's like a holy and whole making spirit. It makes us whole. It connects us with ourselves. And, um, you know, it makes me think of the saying in the Gospel of Thomas, if you bring forth what's within you, it'll save you. If you don't bring forth what's within you, it'll destroy you. Because the greatest poison in the human psyche is repressed or unexpressed creativity. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I can't say enough. I've written extensively in all my books about the profound importance of being creative. And just another thing, for example, in my new book, the one that just came out, there's this philosopher, um, Berdieff, uh, Nicholas Berdieff, who talks about, there's a whole chapter about the profound importance of creativity. And he points out, he's very into the second coming, the coming of Christ. He says, if we participate in our own creative process, we are then bringing the second coming into our world through our creative expression but if we're not creative and if we're just passively waiting for the coming of the messiah then we are gonna eternally just see the crucified face of christ and we're never going to step into the resurrected body the point of what he's making is that we're playing a key role by us activating and you know stepping into and embodying and expressing our creative spirit we are participating via that act of bringing in, you know, the second coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the first time I encountered that idea where that kind of interpretation of the second coming was in this ayahuasca church in their central altar, they have a cross that has two horizontal beams on it, a smaller one above the, the typical beam. And they say that that represents the second coming of Christ, which will happen in the hearts of all people or right. happen in the heart of the individual. And again, it reminds me of Jung saying um, to imitate Christ doesn't mean to do exactly as Christ did, but to live how Christ lived in that he was being completely himself. He was being right, his exactly. own, own it, person and fighting for his individuation, right? And until it cost him his life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. And I'm so glad you bring this up because I mean, I, I write a lot about this where like I point out that unlike 2000 years ago, where like God incarnated through one human being who is kept pure and spotless as the vehicle, you know, for the incarnation of the deity. And think about what happened when Christ incarnated on the planet at the exact same moment, who's there but Satan. And think about it like a dream. Well, that's an expression of how polarized the collective unconscious was. There's the symbol of the light, there's the symbol of the dark, and they're separate, right? And what and this is in the collective works. Young points, he talks about the Christification of many. He's saying what's actually happening now is that God is incarnating not just through one person who's kept, you know, pure, but that God is incarnating through all of humanity, through the collective unconscious. And we actually partake of original sin in that we have a shadow. And so what Jung is saying is that the closer God gets to humanity, the greater the probability of an encounter with evil. And But we ourselves are the vessel that God has prepared to like, in a way, to integrate the opposites, to bring the opposites together. You know, that's mm -hmm. the coincidentia oppositorum of alchemy, the union of the opposites. And what why I'm saying this, this is a, a way of understanding, of creating context for understanding what's happening in our world. Because Jung says, the problem of our time is that we don't understand what's happening in our world. And it clarifies what's happening is we are encountering the darkness of the soul, the darkness of our, of the, our own shadow of the deity, of the archetypal shadow. And he also says, he makes the point, he goes, God has um, put a special purpose, that's his quote, into evil that it is most important for us to know. And this is exactly the idea of Watiko. You see, Watiko, it's the source of the greatest evil. And it's at the bottom of all the myriad world crises in which we're, you know, we're inspired to destroy ourselves in so many ways. And yet 
being a quantum phenomena encoded in Watiko, it's actually helping us to wake up. It's catalyzing our evolution in the same way that Jung was talking about evil. But if we, what I'm pointing out, my whole work is like, yes, it is revealing. It's like God isn't just revealing him or herself by coming down from heaven in through the light. No, it's actually revealing itself by coming up from the underworld through the through the darkness. And to just what I'm meaning is that light doesn't just reveal darkness, light is revealed through the darkness. And that's very Kabbalistic. And, you know, a lot of traditions talk about that. But yeah, this I could go on and on about this. But what you were saying is really mm. profound. Yeah. Again, I mean, <laughs> Jung had so many incredible insights. You know, I was reminded of something else that he said that the greatest threat to humanity, humanity is man himself. And, yeah, yeah. And, talk, and talking about how um, Christianity as an institution and doctrine had really um, not gotten evil right. Uh, you know, he, he thought that uh, there was too much emphasis on the light and that um, Satan was actually like Christ's brother, right? And that he needed... Oh, they needed to that be was integrated. one being. He actually said not just a brother, but they were parts of one being. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and he also says in answer to Job, his greatest work, he calls Satan, Satan is the godfather of humanity as a spiritual being. The point is, is that the figure, Satan is a personification of what he go or evil, that that actually is helping us to wake up. Yeah, I was going to ask you like that... Um, I, it's after uh, Christ's baptism, right? He goes off into the desert for 40 days and he encounters Satan, the adversary. I'd, I'd much rather call Satan the adversary because I think that's clear about the what the role is there, where he's tempting um, Christ with, uh, with power and fame and all of that. And that sounds to me like what you're talking about when you talk about Wetiko. It's that uh, temptation, um, becoming too enamored of the materiality and, and power and things like that. And that would block you from becoming who you're meant to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Jung points out in that 40 days in the desert when when Christ encountered Satan, Jung, you know, comments, he goes, yeah, it shows what Christ was dealing with, the power of devil in himself, in humanity, in the collective psyche. And, um, you know, that's why it's so people who are attracted to positions of power in our world, you know, they're they're seduced by that and they then tend to not be connected with their nature, with their humanity, with their heart, with their empathy. And then they can treat other people as if they're objects. And, you know, and it just that they become the instrument through which evil then plays itself out. Yeah, so it's very different when you're connected with with love, which is our nature, with compassion. That's very different than prioritizing power. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, you talk about with Tico too is um, like um, uh, help me express this, but there's a connection there with scapegoating. Like scapegoating is one of the expressions of with Tico. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can say a lot more about that. Well, think about Christ. Yeah. Christ is the epitome of the archetypal scapegoat right yeah he's he yeah, he's <laughs> purely innocent exactly. he was like this innocent lamb who just and um you know and the thing which is interesting in all the representations of of the resurrected christ he always has his wounds so even when we step into our enlightened nature there's still a sense of that woundedness because the shaman is the wounded healer and a wounded healer archetypally suffers an incurable wound and but instead of that necessarily you know being problematic where you get stuck and identify with being wounded and then oh i need to heal my wounds you that that woundedness becomes a portal to our deeper gifts and the idea of scapegoating i point out that the psychological dynamic underlying what Hiko is shadow projection you know and very simply put if i'm not owning my own darkness right if, if, just think about being in a night dream if I'm disconnected from my own shadow, then what's going to happen? So I'm going to project it out out there into the dream. And then into the dream will walk somebody or a group of people who carry my shadow, my own projection of my own darkness. And then when I see them, I react because I don't realize I'm actually seeing my own reflected darkness. And then when I amplify what I will do to the person carrying the shadow, you know, ultimately I'm going to try to destroy them because 
that's reflecting the the initial inner process of trying to exterminate my own darkness. Now I'm actually playing out my inner process of trying to destroy my own inner darkness. I'm enacting it in the outer world. And by doing that, I'm unwittingly becoming possessed by the very evil that I'm seeing out there and trying to destroy. And that's complete madness. That's shadow projection. Jung calls shadow projection the lie. Who's the liar? It's the mm -hmm. devil. You see, the devil, Watiko, the shadow itself inspires the projection of the shadow. And so this is the underlying, you know, psychological dynamic that fuels Watiko. Hmm. Now, how did you land on the name Watiko? Like, wh why didn't you just call it uh, archetypal shadow or archetypal evil? Right, uh, right, sure. You know, so why this particular I, yeah. entity from uh, Native American culture? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I was I had written a book in the early 2000s on the madness of George W. Bush. And, and yeah, as a way of keeping myself sane, because I was so freaked out, you know, by him being president. And I, I didn't know the word Watiko, but the whole book is about Watiko. And I called it malignant egophrenia, M-E disease, me disease. It's a misidentification of who we think we are. And keep in mind that Jung says the greatest danger facing humanity is for us to identify with a fictitious identity, to identify with who we're not. That's exactly malignant egophrenia. That's me disease. And then I, I, I began, I came across, you know, the word Watiko. And I was reading um, a book on Watiko that just was like precisely describing what mm -hmm. I was writing about. And then the more I thought about it, the more I realized, well, you know, this is an indigenous term and not to appropriate the term, but to honor the term, you know, because the natives had, they were totally tracking Watiko. Right. They had identified in, it. And yeah, yeah. They identified actually, it not. Yeah. Honoring that they had uh, kind of discovered and named uh, this before psychology. Yeah, I get that. Oh, completely, completely. Yeah, and yeah. not only the Native Americans, but every spiritual tradition and a lot of visionary thinkers and artists and philosophers, um, you know, they um, they were all like pointing at Watiko, but in their own unique creative way. So I just thought, well, let me, you know, really try to honor what the Native Americans, um, you know, have, they had given it a name. It, it felt like a sacred name. Right, like what they could contribute yeah. to uh, Western understanding as we mature and evolve. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just in the role of translator. So I, I'm i not, I didn't discover anything or anything like that. No, I'm just, you know, based on my own suffering, I have been able to like, oh, I'm translating this indigenous wisdom that is incredibly helpful for us and is medicine and is profound, um, translating it into a modern psychological idiom that can really speak, you know, to modern people in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's specifically from the Cree people. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Cree mm -hmm. and Ojibwe and yeah, yeah, totally. And um, yeah, so it's, um, you know, and I've been fortunate in that you know, I've had some, you know, people, some Native American people, indigenous people, medicine um, people come to me, they've read my work. And there was one, um, you know, this medicine man who was so impacted by my first book on Watiko, he literally drove out from the East Coast just to meet me because he wanted to, you know, he was so blown away by my work, but he wanted to just meet me in person. And he, he drove out and he, I invited him over for a tea and we had a cup of tea. And then, you know, he just wrote this incredible endorsement, having read my work and met me, you know, because all I'm trying to do is just bring forth, like I'm saying, translate this wisdom in a way that can really transmit to people like you and me who are Western neurotic people who are, you know, gone through our abuse and suffered and it's an incredible way of helping us to get a handle on what's happening so many people they'll read my stuff on watiko and they'll write back going oh my god you know thank you for finding the words i've been going through this for years but i didn't have a context mm -hmm. you know well that goes back to i mean kind of where we started with the importance of um having a, a kind of myth or a narrative or a context 
uh, personification of what you're dealing with, how important that is uh, psychologically to totally to work through, to integrate, to yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's exactly like we have to, to to realize the nature of the beast we're dealing with, you know, and, um, you know, the idea, like, like we were saying before, like when I when I snapped out of just interpreting my experience through the personalistic lands. Yeah, like as a pathology. Oh, yeah, there's all my pathology. It's all, oh, yeah. I'm screwed up. And, and chemical really, imbalance. Oh, yeah, I'm actually, what if what I'm experiencing as a microcosm is actually reflecting and expressing what's in the mic in the macrocosm, in the collective. And and then all of a sudden that cuts through the separate self because what Tico is the separate self. Just think about it, it's this me disease, the misidentification of who we think we are. If we're identified with a separate self, then, well, if I'm an isolated separate self, then you're an other. And if you're an other, then there's fear and fear is the superfood yeah. for Wachiko. And so the idea is, oh, wow, the suffering and the conflict that I'm experiencing, this is actually like an instantiation of the conflict that's in the deity, the conflict that's in the collective unconscious, the conflict that's in all of us, where the microcosm and the macrocosm reflect each other. And you see, that's the whole the whole shamanic archetype. Think about what a shaman does. They have such empathy. They will literally take on the illness of the client or the community. And taking it on means they'll have it out with it. They'll 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 be in the arena wrestling with it. But taking on means they'll also like you know take it within themselves. You know, it's like when you catch a cold, you get infected, but you've actually contained it. And so by taking it within themselves then the shaman falls ill they take on the illness they 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 literally fall ill from the illness that the client or the community is suffering from but if they stay stuck and you know they they're they're always ill then they need a shaman they can't be a benefit for other people but the the accomplished shaman takes that occasion of them falling ill and experiencing the illness from the inside to like deepen their connection with the self with their true nature and as they slowly metabolize that and do that, and they get brought back to themselves in an even deeper way than before, them doing that, they've modeled and created the template in the collective unconscious for the client or the community or the world to do the same thing. And that's why I keep on talking about we are all potential shamans in training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm echoing you from where I am and where I've come to. So it's just nice to... Um hear that from you as well because i really think it's something and i think like uh some kind of liberal minded western people have a real problem when i use the word um shamanism shamanic and i always have to remind them that the word shamanism is uh from anthropology it's it's based on uh you know a mongolian word or siberian word from the tungus people but it's, it was created to describe a kind of set of practices and beliefs. So it's an anthropological term. So saying shamanism or shaman isn't appropriating from any indigenous person. Yeah, and, and the shaman. In fact, in uh -huh. fact in, in, indigenous medicine people that I've met and, and heard and read uh, will appropriate that term because it seems to describe what they're doing and it's a way to communicate. Uh, their belief system or their set of practices to a Western audience. So I, I have no problem with the term myself. I, you know, it's problematic, like you said, when people uh, kind of claim that as a, as a title or a role uh, without having been through an initiation yeah. and being held within community and all of that. But to describe a set of practices or a particular worldview, I think it's it's useful. Yeah, well, the, keep in mind that the shaman is the primordial healer. It, it, it underlies and precedes like, you know, like the, the psychotherapist who's, you know, in the book, I have a whole section on how the psychotherapist is the shaman. In well, Western culture. can be, but often yeah, psychotherapy yeah, yeah, exactly. has been reductionist and materialist chemical and behaviorist, imbalances. right. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. That's very flatland. And oh, just take this pill and you'll be better or we'll change your behavior. But no, you know, their real function is, you know, if they're really being, you know, because uh, like a like a therapist is this this doctor of the soul, it's ministering to the soul. And so the shaman is the primordial healer and creative artist and 
and and yeah no it's it's a very it's you know it's a very existential term in that just like if somebody in buddhism they talk about oh we have buddha nature and if somebody who's not a buddhist says oh well you know i have buddha nature they're not appropriating no that's that's a term that they buddhists don't monopolize that term it's pointing at our true nature it doesn't make a difference what name you use you could call it christ nature the true nature the perfect nature the buddha nature same thing with the whole shamanic thing and um yeah it's it's such a i think it's a really helpful um idea to bring in because just to remember the shaman doesn't exist in isolation there's you know there's no one who does that's the idea that when you see through the separate self we're all interconnected and interdependent and so the shaman is a role in the field that gets dreamed up by the community okay and what i'm saying is that with this collective madness that's that's going on in our world today we are getting dreamed up each one of us to potentially step into our shamanic function and be the creative artist be the storyteller okay and um be the dreamer where we're creating our own myth because we're actually recreating ourselves in the image of our creator as creative beings you see that's the idea when we have the realization of our self of our true self of our nature well what is our nature our nature is by its very nature creative so when we have realization of our nature we become creative and the more we express ourselves and embody being creative the deep the more deeply we know our nature in a positive feedback loop that literally creates light and it creates light upon light endlessly that's what's available to us we have we are already in possession of the healing of the medicine we are that but we don't realize that we're unconscious of that so then our own creative agency gets outsourced and projected outside and the powers of the state are more than happy to use our creative powers against us because Watiko mm -hmm. has no creative agency it's a master impersonator the apocryphal text calls it the counterfeiting spirit but it plugs into our own creative agency to the extent we're not using it and it turns it against us in a way that's killing us that's why it's so profoundly important for each one of us to connect with our creative spirit amen to that paul amen to that yeah i think that is actually it, it's come up as maybe one of the most important things for me to advocate for these days particularly um because of the overwhelming fascination people have with AI generated artwork at the moment. Um, I, I want to get your read on this, but what I've been cautioning people uh, with is, you know, the way I think of it is every time you outsource your creativity to AI, you're losing a piece of your soul. And I, I really believe that. And from where I'm sitting, I would say what you're describing is Wetiko. AI is a manifestation of Wetiko, in my view. I mean, yeah. what's what well, are your I thoughts? can yeah, I can comment on that. I mean, there on the one hand, there are these incredible these benefits from AI that are undeniable. But I'm you know I'm not the only one. I mean, it's incredibly frightening, and it has this very great potential, you know, to to manifest in a in a in a darker way, in an evil way, because to connect it to Watiko, one of the things that happens when, because we all have Watiko in potential and that it exists in the collective unconscious. And so we all can fall prey and act out our unconscious. And then we're an, a vector, an instrument for Watiko. But when somebody really, when Watiko gets established in their psyche and they unwittingly become an outpost, you know, for Watiko, in a way, they become like a robot. They become an automaton. They're mm -hmm. just a series of conditioned responses. They've drank in the propaganda. They're just a parrot. They they don't have their discernment. They they don't. They're not able to creatively respond, mm -hmm. and they you know really become like a robot. And interesting, that's very much reflective of AI. And so the idea is like anything, like any archetype is bipolar. It has a positive and or a negative mm -hmm. side and potential. Mm -hmm. So AI could be unbelievably beneficial in so many ways, but so many people, you know, I'm just one of them are, are warning there's an incredible danger 
mm-hmm. you know, with AI, it might, it's like an, it's like an order of magnitude, even more, you know, scary than like, you know, the whole pandemic or vaccine or Ukraine war or anything like that. All of that stuff. Yeah. We've been dealing with that for years. The AI thing is a higher dimensional process. And there are some people I know who connect AI with like these negative ETs, that this is the way that ETs are harvesting the human soul and the human creativity, you know? So Mm -hmm. no, I'm, it's a really deep um, potential shadow that AI opens up, you know, and it's, it's freaky to me because, you know, we've all experienced it where it's getting harder and harder to differentiate. Oh, this article I'm writing, this picture I'm looking at, this like audio I'm listening to, is that real or is that AI generated? And then what's real and what's fake becomes more and more impossible to distinguish. That's really frightening. I I think that's such a good point. Um, Somebody had me on their podcast yesterday and she was uh, talking about AI and um, asking me, you know, how does someone discern whether something's generated by AI or a human? Like how, how can we tell that something has soul? And my response to her was, well, people have to be connected to the, their own soul in order to discern soul in the world to become an animist. Uh, it, like animism to me is just a natural outcome of being in touch with soul. Because like soul is the sense organ for soul in the world. Uh, and so I think everything that you've been talking about, like the inner work, uh, dreaming, creativity is a way for us to connect with our soul and you know we could also say the diamond is uh kind of an aspect or soul or accompanies the soul and the diamond has your whole life plan and it's going to try and help steer you along that path so how like in practical terms yeah 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 how can people listen to their diamond? Yeah. How can they how yeah. can they discern between the diamond speaking and Watiko speaking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great, I think that's a great way to sort of get closure on our interview today because you know, first off, in the new book, I have a, a big chapter on um the soul, on the battle for our soul. And I bring in the concept of the diamond and of the angel, because the angel is an equivalent term for the diamond. And just to get really practical. So, you know, I'm I'm a writer and I write every morning. That's, you know, my time for my creative writing. And when I'm waking up, you know, so I'm like a little turtle when they when they break out of their little eggshell on the ocean beach, they just instinctively crawl to the ocean. I wake up and I crawl out of bed to my computer to start to write. That's I don't even think about not doing that. And and I'm brushing my teeth and all of a sudden I'm getting downloads and I've learned to differentiate, to differentiate the energetic signature of when I'm just in my sort of like the neurotic monkey mind that I just need to ignore. There's a different energy when I'm getting a download because that's my diamond, that's my angel. And it's telling me what I'm going to write about, how I'm going to write about it. And I've learned to honor that and to pay attention And then all of a sudden I feel like I'm an employee getting the dictate from the boss. And and that's why when I write my stuff, I just, I don't even feel identified with being the writer. Like oftentimes I'll read it later and I'll be like, wow, that's really good. Like who, who wrote that, you know, and it came through me, but I was just an open instrument tapping into the creative source. And so that's the diamond and that, and that happens all throughout the day where we get these intuitive, you know, felt senses of something. And just more and more, you develop a a sensitivity to distinguish between the neurotic monkey mind and the daimon. And this is what Jung was was all about in the therapy he created. He he called it the ego self-axis, that we as an ego, we need to develop sort of an intimate relationship with the higher self, just like think of the unconscious. You know, the unconscious is a mirror. It reflects back to us our own attitude towards it. So it's like getting into intimate relationship with this wiser part of ourselves. And think about Jung. He he calls the greatest discovery of the entire 20th century in the realm of psychology was the discovery of the reality of the psyche. And what he's calling the reality of the psyche 
it's not objective like these like this daimon this angel this inner voice it doesn't exist objectively separate from our awareness but it's not just our imagination it's not just our projection there's this intermediate realm that couples the objective and the subjective that's also the realm of the quantum it's the realm of shamanic visions and dreams and that's what you more and more become familiar with and um and that then will help you to access the creative source you know of the universe which you know is in you and then you become a vehicle to like you know, to transmit that in whatever way you're inspired. And by doing that, there's like a, then you create whatever the work of art is, you know, writing or dancing or painting or whatever it is, that work becomes an artifact. That's like a testament to that experience that actually transmits the realization in which you were partaking via the creative process. So you see, and then what happens when that happens, when you're able to, just like with my work with the mind virus, I'm trying to, to like transmit this to people because it's such a liberating idea. Like what Jung says in times of collective psychosis, the only thing that will save us is a new symbolic idea. That's a quote of Jung. That's what Watiko is. And think about that all the tyrants throughout history, the one thing they were most afraid of was an idea whose time has come. And that's exactly what Tico. And then when people get switched on, and because it's a very psychoactivating idea, the mind virus, what Tico idea, then their psyche gets activated and they start getting in touch with their own creativity, like it's contagious. And then that can go viral. And that can actually catalyze like an expansion of consciousness in our species. You know, that's mm. what all of this is about. Mm. Yeah. I, I just want to dwell a little bit on uh, the discernment between um, the adversary and the helping spirit, you know, the, the daimonic versus the demonic. Right. Uh, wasn't it Socrates who said that his daimon always told him no? Like that's how he, uh, the, the daimon was guiding him. It was by saying, nope, nope, not this, not that. Like it was more of a via negativa rather than, Feeling him with this positive affirmation, that's the direction. It, it was well, that's him interesting, know. you know, because one of the best, um, you know, because I'm an artist, one of the like, probably the best self portrait I ever did. And it was after getting initiated into Watiko and having that fever for the for the year. This was the very first drawing I did after that. Um, and what it was, I remember really clearly, it was a pencil drawing. And I was drawing my, you know, my self-portrait and I'm like, no, 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 that's not it. You know, erase. No, 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 that's not it. No, no. And then all of a sudden, wow, that's it. And I had no idea what I was looking for, but I knew what I wasn't looking for. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, my wife and I, uh, we often just talk about like what's going on in the inner world and also what's going on in our businesses too. And I was talking to her one day and I was saying, you know, it's just like whatever I'm putting out there, the way I'm putting it out there, I don't think is like getting through in the right way. Um, I think I'm, maybe I'm going to try something a little more conventional or something. And I'm kind of playing with this idea of uh, buttoning things up a little more, getting a little more clear, narrowing things down, getting into my niche, all these things that business coaches tell you to do. And then all of a sudden this idea entered the room and we just started riffing on this other idea that was more fun and outlandish, more reflective of who I really am. And we were both filled with like all of this energy and uh, Debbie kind of like, you know, after in the aftermath of that, you know, when things had settled down, she said, that was like a demonic intervention that just happened. <laughs> like yeah, you were yeah, about yeah. to go, you're about to go steer down, like make a pivot toward a more kind of conventional path or something. And then something came in and this like fresh idea came in and it, it, we, we just both felt it and it inspired yeah. us to, to kind of co-create. Yeah. And just one, one final thing in that, that it's, it's as if that idea was, was in the air and it was waiting for a receptacle vehicle. Mm. And you were, mm. and you were, your wife got drafted into being that instrument. Yeah. But it was like the moment when I started to veer off what I would call maybe like my, my true right. path or a path that was authentic to me. Uh, this moment I started to veer off, it was like, oh, this lightning bolt came in. It was like, no, right. no, no. Yeah. Right. Totally. Totally. So sometimes I tell people, you know, that thing that you're labeling the inner saboteur, maybe that that entity is working in your best interest by keeping you from doing things you shouldn't be doing. Yeah. 
right you know, very like tri- exactly. tripping that's, you up on the way yeah that's the idea that what it can manifest as that saboteur as that obstacle but it actually might you know encoded within it hidden within it, it might actually be an ally absolutely yeah well, this has been really fun to talk to you. I mean, we just, I think, uh, have so many common interests. And right, um, totally. I appreciate the way that you've kind of put things together and done your own synthesis over the years. Uh, it's helpful for me as a person who's like finding these threads and seeing how they might fit together to kind of hear how you've put it together. Uh, it's a, inspiring and encouraging and also uh, gives a little bit of guidance too at times. So I appreciate what you're doing, Paul. Yeah, I really appreciate that. That really just thank you so much. Yeah. Well, um, I'm going to tell everyone how to get your book and I'm going to tell them where to get it and send them to your website where you have uh, tons of great writing and articles for free where people can delve in a little more. Um, and maybe we'll talk a little later down the road. Who knows? Yeah, I would love that. I just, it's great. so great. I mean, just we we first met during this interview. And I also feel a real connection and a kinship. And it's like, oh, yeah, here is somebody who speaks the language. I get that, too. So I'd be happy to connect down the road. Thank yeah, you wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Well, take care. Enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>